At the conclusion of this morning's parasha, we read in the final sentence of the birth of Yishmael and God's commanding Abraham to circumcise the male members of his household at eight days old. There's nothing particularly unusual there after, after we knew that already. But if you look at the sentence very clearly, it says something that's very troubling. And that is, it tells us that God instructs Abraham to circumcise not just himself, but his entire household. His entire household? What male members of his household are we talking about here? Abraham only had one son, and at this time, Yishmael was probably busy studying hard for his bar mitzvah. Instead of a fountain pen, he ended up with a bris. Now, who are we talking about here? Who else was Abraham circumcising? Who were these members of his household? And more importantly, where did they come from? I'm going to try and answer it for you. At the beginning of the parasha, God tells Abraham, Lech lecha. Go. May Aratzacha from your land, or may Moladatacha from your birthplace, or may Beisavicha, and to your father, and from your father's home. Ela Aratzashar Echo to the land which I will show you. In other words, the land of Canaan. And so, what does Abraham do? He packs up his wife, Sarah, his nephew, Lot, and he heads towards Canaan, just as God had commanded him. Okay, so now there's three people. I wouldn't exactly call that a household. So again, where did this household come from? And in order to answer that, we need to go back a bit and see why God chose Abraham in the first place. What, if anything, enabled Abraham to obtain a household of newly circumcised men? Now, the Torah never tells us what Abraham did that made him so worthy of being selected by God. You know, at least with Moses, for example, we know he killed an Egyptian taskmaster. He watered, he watered Jethro's daughter's flock. But Abraham... What did he do? The Torah doesn't tell us. The Midrash, on the other hand, fills in the gaps of Abraham's early life. And I'm sure you recognize or will recognize some of the stories from your Hebrew school days. We are all probably familiar with the story of how Abraham's father, Terach, was a manufacturer of idols. And on one occasion, we're told that a woman came in with a plate full of flour and asked Abraham to offer it to the idols for a very special blessing for her. And Abraham took a stick, and what did he do? He broke all the other idols, and he put the stick in the hand of the largest one. And when his father returned and saw the broken idols, he asked Abraham, what happened here? And Abraham told him that a woman came in with a plate of fine meal and requested me to offer it to them. And one of the idols started fighting with the other one because they wanted to eat first. And the largest idol then picked up the stick and broke it and broke the other ones. Of course, this is a Midrashic text. It's not found in the, in the, in the Torah. The Midrash this particular Midrash, which is one of a number of them, gives us a sort of a snippet of Abraham's early life and explains how Abraham came to believe in the one true God. They explain how Abraham came to realize that idol worship was ridiculous. But was that enough to make Abraham the father of a great nation? and the one through whom all nations will ultimately be blessed. 
And to accommodate, accumulate such a large household, how did he do this? And the answer is no. Believe in one God wasn't the only reason. The other reason was that Abraham didn't just keep his belief to himself. Many people do. They have their beliefs and they say, my beliefs are mine, they're private, they're personal, and they don't talk about them. What did he do? He took action. He smashed the idols and he confronted his father about his newfound belief. And then what did Abraham do? He went out and he spread the word. He sought to convert all of humanity to his belief. He was, as they say, the world's first evangelical. And he was successful. He attracted tens of thousands of followers. And so when Abraham left Haran for the journey to the promised land, he took them with him. In the words of one of my favorite lines from the Torah, and I've quoted this many times, the Torah tells us, Ve'et ha-nefesh asher asu b'charan. Abraham and Sarah took them with, what did they take with? The souls that they had made in Haran. Who were these souls? Those who Abraham converted. He didn't abandon them. He took them with him. He took them in as part of his own family, as part of his own household. And they stayed with him for all those years. The answer to the question of who were the members of Abraham's household, who he circumcised 24 years later, were all the people whose lives were changed and influenced under Abraham and Sarah's guidance. It's all the people who converted. And if not to Judaism, or to Abraham's version of Judaism, let's put it that way, then at least to monotheism. Abraham and Sarah made and transformed people's souls. So what does it mean to make souls? We make babies, we make friends, we make neighbors, but souls? Making souls takes a very different skill set. It is much more complicated than making babies or making friends. Not everyone can do it. Not everyone does it. And this is why Abraham's actions are so meaningful. Look at the way in which Abraham made nefashot, how he made souls. Did Abraham stand on the street corner in Ur Kastim and Haran on, on a soapbox and shout, believe in the one true God or your soul will burn in hell? No, of course he didn't. Did he go from door to door with leaflets telling his neighbors about Judaism? No, of course not. Did he make telephone calls? Did he put up a website? No, of course he didn't. So let's, let's look at this. Did Abraham build a shul? Did he hire a rabbi or a cantor? Did he offer the best sacrifices or sing the best melodies? Did Abraham bring in guest speakers to his tent? Did he have programs and activities that drew thousands of people from all over Haran and Canaan? No, he didn't. Abraham did none of these things. Did he have big kiddushes? Okay, that's another deal. Perhaps he had big kiddushes, I don't know. But we know that he did use food. After all, he was always serving food to his guests. This is what we're told, the Torah tells us. We'll see it next week. And yes, while the saying, if you feed them, they will come, was and indeed is true, Abraham made in the fashot, he made souls in a very simple way. And he did so by the way he led his life through hospitality and through kindness. There is a very beautiful Midrashic text which tells us how Abraham built an inn in Beersheba at a place where merchants would pass by. And he invited them in and he gave them food and he gave them drink. And when these merchants or travelers or strangers, whatever you want to call them, would ask Abraham how they could repay him, 
Abraham didn't ask for money. He said, don't forget to thank God, for he is the one that provided you with all of this. And when people saw that this was a God-fearing man, and how a God-fearing man behaved, they were naturally drawn to him. And so they spoke to him, they questioned him, they broke bread with him, they followed him, and then concluded that this is a man of God, somebody they wanted to emulate. There was no scare tactics in Abraham's method. There was no rabbi telling that your way of Judaism is wrong and my way of Judaism is right. None of that. No harassment, no high pressure salesmanship. Just a simple, honest, kind and good way of life that people responded to and that people wanted to follow. Today, we stand in Abraham's shoes. We too can make nefashot, just like Abraham did. How? By acting as Abraham would have done. By being a dogma, by being an example, a role model. By leading our lives with kindness towards man and with reverence for God. Rabbi Elliot Dorf tells this story which explains the idea. He went on to tell, it's from his own life story, he said that in 1962, he says, I spent my first year as a counselor at Camp Ramine, Wisconsin. The nearest town of any size to camp was Eagle River. And in Eagle River, there was a very famous ice cream parlor that the staff would visit on the days off. It was called Zimpleman's. Furthermore, Eagle River had a resident population of about a thousand people who knew each other and easily recognized these summer interlopers. So during staff week, Rabbi Burton Cohen, the camp director, gathered the counselors and he warned them, when you go into Zimpleman's, you are not just yourself there. You are a Ramah staff member. You are not just a Ramah staff member, but you are a Jew. So your behavior in Zimpleman's reflects not only on you personally, not only on Ramah, but on the entire Jewish people. As Rabbi Dorf went on to say, that was my introduction to Jewish guilt. It was also my introduction to the Jewish value of Kiddush Hashem, of the sanctification of God's name. How doing so? By, the, by through the way one acts as an, in an exemplary manner. And of course it's reverse. What is its reverse? Its reverse is Chilul Hashem desecration of God's name when you act badly. The heritage that God gave us and the Jewish people by acting poorly in one's interactions with others is called a chilul Hashem. We must act in such a way that non-Jews indeed do bless themselves through us, saying, may you be, may you act, em empathize, study, Extend yourself to others like the Jews. And I will add, like our forefathers, or forefather Abraham also did. May we, the descendants of Abraham, continue to follow in his footsteps by acting as he would act, with kindness, with hospitality, and with godliness towards all who we meet, knowing that we too are here to make nefashot, to make souls, and to bring people closer to God. Kenihi so it should be Shabbat Shalom.